Francesca got her bachelor's degree at Florida State um, and then came here to OU where she earned a master's before starting on her PhD. She works with us within the Bliss Group. Um, she works with several of us here in the room, but she works directly um, with Petra uh, on the Tracer project. She also works closely with Tyler. Um, we've already heard um, some about the Tracer project this year, right? Yes, the years blurred together, I don't know. It's all together. Um, but the Tracer project is a large project um, that we have a couple of students working on. Um, and so we'll be hearing on it annually for um, a little bit now. But um, so welcome back if you've heard about it before. And with that, I will give it to you. Thank you. Yeah, today we will be once again looking at the Tracer project and mostly the thermodynamic impacts as a result of the sea breeze, starting with looking at what is our coastal boundary layer and what makes it unique? She's special because she's an interfacial zone between a continental boundary layer and a marine boundary layer. And they vary in their degrees of turbulent intensity, depth, and thermodynamic uh, stability. And because they are at different temperatures due to land heating up a lot faster than the water, a lot of times there are microscale and mesoscale circulations that set up and uh, to equilibrate these differences between the structures. And that's how we get our sea breeze. So the sea breeze is a mesoscale phenomenon that is caused by that pressure differential due to um, differential heating. And although it is often thought as just a massive circulation was a wall of cool, moist air, it does have these small scale features within it, such as lobes and clefts, um, as well as Kelvin Hemholtz billows behind the sea breeze front um, that raises into a sea breeze head. Um, and the sea breeze is, uh, changes the characteristics of the boundary layer uh, as it is often bringing on shore lower TKE fluid, also cooler, more moist air, but also how the sea breeze propagates is a function of the boundary layer itself. What its stability, um, how can how the um, strongly convective the boundary layer is um, and different wind shears. So why do we care about the boundary layer? On a good day, it is really nice. It brings a nice cool breeze um, to a hot summer day but how that actually impacts human comfort in uh, coastal metropolises is not fully understood. Sometimes it can bring a lot of moisture, but not a lot of cooling, which can in turn raise the um, heat risk. On a bad day, it can lead to high uh, tropospheric ozone and trap surface-based pollutants, but that is dependent on the depth of the circulation, um, stability, and overall flow that we're not very good at modeling and don't fully understand exactly how to forecast it well. Also, my favorite reason is the sea breeze is a frequent driver of convection initiation. You get these big, beautiful storms that will really ruin your beach day. But when, where, and why it happens is still hotly debated, um, and we are still looking into that. So tying all of these different functions together motivated the tracer field campaign, um, the Tracking Aerosol Convection Interaction Experiment, which was funded by the DOE and ARM and provided a wealth of observation platforms, including a lot of different cloud and precipitation radars, um, remote sensors, aerosol observations, and uh, trace gas um, concentration ob observers. Um, to understand the convective cloud life cycle, also how deep cloud or deep convective um, life cycles interact with aerosols and a bunch of different other radiative forcing questions that we have. Tracer ha occurred over um, the Houston Galveston area. This was across 2022, where there were some remote sensing uh, equipment in these three locations kind of in a line towards the coast um, where a lot of these platforms were all centered at this main arm facility and then there were these two dots down here thumbtacks down here and those are where the tracer uas um, completed their flights tracer uas was a campaign within the broader 
tracer campaign that utilized two UAS platforms to gather observations in the boundary layer up to 609 meters. There was a rotary wing UAS, which is our copter son here at OU, and there's also the CU Boulder Raven, which is a fixed wing um, doing more transects and helical profiles. We'll be focusing on our OU copter son data and we did flight cadences of every 30 minutes um, and increased to 15 when we expected the sea breeze to come through. So we have a lot of vertical profiles of temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, and direction, um, up to 546 of those profiles throughout this campaign that occurred from June to September 2022. The data was processed by only using the ascending uh, profile data at 10 hertz applying the calibrations, averaging the duplicate sensors, which there are three of the temperature and relative humidity sensors averaged together, and then bin to five meters. So we have high resolution, five meter um, vertical resolution data up to every 15 minutes. The winds are calculated using a wind vane algorithm. So the copter, while it is in flight, it will steer into the wind for maximum stability, and it also lets us know what the direction is. And then using the um, stability um, alterations to the copter, we can back out the wind speed and a better estimate of the wind direction. Overall, we had quite a few sea breeze cases throughout Tracer UAS, um, most of which happening in June and July, August being a very wet month. Uh, so a lot of synoptically forced precipitation, not a lot of chances for sea breeze to develop, but this was also an unseasonably dry summer for the Houston area. They were in drought for most of it. Um, the sea breeze con convective storms that we did see were pretty uh, shallow, short-lived, um, didn't really have a lot, of, um, a lot of lifetime to them. But we do have a decent amount of convective cases. And with that, we can kind of look at the different components of sea breeze and convection and neither um, or one of each. And with that, we like to know when did our sea breeze actually move through? Detecting the sea breeze front is more difficult than one would expect. Um, the thermodynamic impacts, as I will talk about very shortly, are not as clear cut as we all hoped. So we really had to depend on looking at just wind direction um, with uh, gathering uh, information on how a scientist from Brookhaven National Lab detected their sea breeze time. Uh, we used a change point algorithm um, on the 300 meters, so that midpoint in our profile, uh, wind direction. And it was able to detect not only the sea breeze, but also the bay breeze. Um, as we saw, I can circle back. One of these locations is, well, let's go one more back. One of these locations is much closer to Galveston Bay than the other, which is why it had a lot of um, more bay impacts than the other. But luckily, this uh, change point algorithm was able to detect both. And it's subjectively analyzed to identify, okay, yes, this is the bay breeze and because it occurs first, um, and this is the sea breeze later on. And then down here is just, violin plots of the um, occurrence of your sea breeze and bay breeze spanning quite a large time frame. Um, typically, the later in the, uh, in the year, so August, September, the later the sea breezes were uh, in time of day. So let's look right at a very nice sea breeze case, one that is well behaved in terms of moistening after the sea breeze front has passed, very shallow or very slight cooling, most notably in potential temperature, and clear increase in wind speeds from the southeast direction. All fine and well. But we also have sea breezes that look like this, where after the passage of your sea breeze front, when winds really start to pick up, we actually see a drying and overall variable progression of moisture leading to moistening at the end and overall not much change in temperature at all. So when we wanted to try to 
look at what all of these cases um, have in common, what their patterns are, compositing them um, by their locations to see if there are any clear differences, kind of just got a lot of washed out results, except for in the kinematics. The kinematics are showing what we expect. Um, at UHC, which is the one closer to Galveston Bay, we do see this bay breeze to sea breeze transition. Moisture, not really seeing what, uh, we are not telling us what we want to hear. Um, and then at the other location, similarly, we see the sea breeze move on shore, and there is a little bit more moistening, but temperature's kind of all over the place. And that's just because there are a lot of deviations within this data set. Um, the only thing that actually decreases in its standard deviation, this is standardized by the way, is wind speed. Um, the kinematics are reliable, but the thermodynamics are not. So we needed to figure out how we can actually quantify the differences between these cases and how much variability there is, which is how we came to rate of change. Essentially, just your very typical how, what are your warming and cooling rates um, with time, I uh, processed the data to do just 200 meter bin or average layers. So gathering your temperature across um, a 200 meter layer and then just doing a um, center, um, centrally differentiated with time. And same with water vapor mixing ratio here on the right. And this is our kind of classical sea breeze, and we see this diurnal heating, which we expect, very weak cooling, and then it's pretty much consistent for the rest of the day. As for water vapor mixing ratio, a little bit of drying out as the boundary layer is becoming more convectively well mixed, very sharp increase in low in um, moisture, and then gradual um, mixing out as we go on with time. And if we look at this, um, in the same way, these side by side, your classical versus atypical, we can kind of look at, okay, we see these same, um, these same patterns that we see in the raw data, but now we can really isolate them around the time of the sea breeze and compare them across events, have a quantifiable, um, have a, have a quantity um, to compare and do statistics on. So, We'll start with some histograms on the temperature rate of change across those three layers with increasing darkness being the um, increasing in height. And these values are only up to two hours after your sea breeze front passage. Didn't want to get into any of the other factors like uh, mixing out or anything. So we really want to isolate what is the sea breeze doing for the following two hours. And while there is um, a large spread amongst what, um, how the temperature evolves, it is skewed negative in both um, bay breeze and sea breeze, which is good. It's what we want to see. Overall, the sea breeze is cooling the environment, but not always. And it is a pretty normal distribution, um, which will be beneficial in the future. And there's not a whole lot of, a whole lot of variability uh, across the different layers. The changes are relatively homogeneous. We're not seeing any type, we're not identifying the top of the um, sea breeze in this instance. We're only flying to 609 meters, um, but that 609 meters is relatively homogeneous after the sea breeze. Similarly with water vapor mixing ratio, um, the sea breeze is a lot more normally distributed than the bay breeze, but still within that um, uh, proper value for skewness to be considered normal. Um, and this is also uh, skewed slightly positive, which also good to see. We want to know that the sea breeze for the most part is moistening, but not always. And these changes to the water vapor mixing ratio are more substantial than the changes to temperature um, in terms of we standardize the quantity, it's about twice as, um, increasing twice as much compared to changes in temperature. And with that, we can isolate what are some of the reasons that the sea breeze is variable. What is driving it to be more impactful in some instances than others? 
So we can look at the sea breeze type. And down here is a little refresher on what different types of sea breezes are. As I just learned about, they have different categories. Um, basically, your pure sea breeze is what every textbook has taught you. There's offshore flow to begin with, and then your sea breeze um, moves onshore, and you have a lot of convergence. We only saw that a couple of times, about 20% of the time while we were down at Tracer. Um, we saw a lot of these corkscrew and synoptic cases, which are when your prevailing flow is already slightly onshore. Synoptic is fully onshore, shore, perpendicular, and onshore. Corkscrew has a little bit of an angle, so it is getting some of that land fetch. Um, and these are our two most common sea breeze types. Backdoor, we only see one of them, so take these results for a grain of, uh, grain of salt. Um, but our corkscrew and pure sea breezes are our most efficient coolers. Um, but corkscrew is, has the weakest median moistening with some of the largest outliers compared to synoptic, which has slightly um, higher median moistening, but some of the most drying outliers, which makes sense. Your, on, your onshore flow is already advecting a lot of moist air. As you pick up um, wind speeds, you might just be lofting it vertically, um, moving some of that moisture out. And um, your synoptic also has a lot of warming outliers. Um, similarly, it's already bringing on that cooler moisture air, so it could be uh, lofting a lot of that marine air that's already on shore. And like I said, the distributions of these um, rates of change were normal enough to perform a two sample Z test to compare different, um, how different the means are for these different categories. So kind of walking through, as expected, the sea breeze is a better cooler than the bay breeze, but not on this list. The, bay, the sea breeze is not a better, uh, does not provide more moisture to the environment than the bay breeze. Corkscrews, corkscrew sea breezes, the one that have a little bit of that um, post parallel um, flow to it, cool more efficiently than synoptic. And while I could not visibly see that there was a lot of difference between the layers, there is more moisture ejected by sea breezes in the lowest layer than the highest layer. Um, and then these later sea breezes are more efficient at cooling and moistening. As, we, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the September sea breezes, they occurred a lot later um, and in turn had a lot more cooling and moistening probably due to the additive properties of the evening transition, transition, lessening turbulent intensity, and keeping some of those effects really close to the surface. And then the sea breeze is cooler, or does more cooling at the coastal center close to the Galveston Bay um, than our other location, which only experiences a sea breeze. So our bay breeze has to be um, priming the environment a little bit more so that it can cool a little bit more efficiently once the sea breeze actually moves through. So we will move, uh, change gears just a little bit into how do we quantify stability? And you know, it took me a lot of tries. Um, so just throwing up a lot of uh, random rabbit holes I went down, but two of these kind of inspired something. Looking at um, equivalent potential temperature. Um, so a conserved measurement of moist static stability. Um, wanted to look at that just to be able to really capture the moist moisture impacts because even virtual potential temperature wasn't really highlighting those kinds of changes uh, to the environment. And as we saw, the moisture changes are often more intense than the temperature changes. Um, and looking at stability in a traditional sense of lapse rate, when your temperature isn't really changing all that much, or your vertical structure is still dry adiabatic, we weren't really, weren't really getting anywhere. So we came to equivalent potential temperature. And air masses with high theta E have been noted to enhance convective intensity. 
So we will have these four categories that we will kind of look at for the remainder of these slides. Um, the upper two are the sea breeze, um, and then this first column is convection with convection. So if we look at these two sea breeze events, we can see that there is a bit of a increase in theta E after this gray dashed line, which I don't know if you can see super well, but it lies right around this divide. Whereas with convection, we do have a lowering of um, theta E during convective time periods. And then across these kind of null events, no sea breeze, no convection, it's pretty consistent. So if we composite all of those theta E cases into these four categories, we can see that just looking very surface level without a sea breeze, theta E is actually higher, um, which was unexpected, but kind of makes sense because a lot of times when there isn't a sea breeze, it's because there's either too much onshore flow or too much else going on um, convectively to allow for a sea breeze to develop. And overall, with or without convection, in the absence of a sea breeze, not a not, not big change. Um, but if we do have a sea breeze, with or without convection, an hour before the sea breeze passes, these start to diverge. And when they're um, before convection occurs, we and before the sea breeze even arrives, we see theta E growing with time. Whereas um, no convection, it starts to decrease a little bit, stays roughly the same. Um, and we really see that separation occur right at Seabreeze passage time. And like I said, the um, lack of sea breeze cases have on average higher theta E values. So we wanted to be able to standardize um, the changes in theta E, not so much how um, large theta E is or how much it's uh, changing with time. So going through a few different methods, decided to remove the daily mean. As we saw in kind of those null cases, it's pretty well mixed. Um, it is a conserved quantity. It's well mixed and stays relatively consistent throughout the day. So removing the daily mean helps us isolate these um, kind of change point times, these big shifts, either due to convection or the sea breeze. And um, so this way we can kind of take some of the, take some of the noise out, even though in these kind of null cases, there's still going to be a lot of noise because it's just a lot of, at that point, turbulent boundary layer variability more than some sort of actual forcing mechanism. And because there is a lot of variability, we use these box and whisker plots that are composited in time um, across all of the cases. And we can use those same four groups to look at how there are how their difference or their evolution is different. And starting with kind of our null case, we see the kind of typical theta E evolution. Um, it is a little bit higher in the morning as you have the mo most moisture and kind of burns out as your uh, turbulent mixing lofts it higher and there's more warming. So you have kind of a dip midday and then it trends upwards towards the evening. With our sea breeze cases, we see a lot uh, shorter um, wavelength kind of evolution where there is a kind of peak in the midday when we would typically see the sea breeze um, opposite to in these null cases where there's a minima. Um, but the days with convection, it's a much uh, higher amplitude peak than without convection. And then without a sea breeze with convection, we do see higher uh, theta E values in the morning with a slight dip and then a slight recovery. Um, probably right before convection. We don't have a lot of flights in the evening because if it's raining, we couldn't fly. So this point of it leading up is that um, convective environment becoming primed and ready um, leading up to storm development. And all of these were um, composited by hour of the day. If we just look at our two sea breeze cases or our two sea breeze um, 
categories, we can composite them by um, time about sea breeze passage, which even more amplifies that kind of wave-like pattern. And went even smaller into half uh, hour increments just to really see all of those fine scale features. And with convection, we do see this sharper increase of about two degrees um, prior to that kind of convective or post-convection drop in theta E. When there isn't convection, we have this increase of about one degree Kelvin, not very substantial, and it's very consistent throughout the evening or throughout the rest of the day. So these have just little features that are slightly different that we can notice even an hour prior to the sea breeze passage. And with that, I will throw up my summary slides. Essentially, the thermodynamic impacts of the sea breeze are far more variable than I ever expected and are dependent on your um, time of day, the time that the sea breeze passes through, influences from the bay breeze, and um, your prevailing flow, which was well known, but not um, documented in this sort of way. And the sea breeze often increases theta E, which was a little bit counterintuitive. You expect it to cool a little bit more than it would moisten, therefore reducing your convective potential. But because they're kind of offset, um, you do see this increase. And with that, I will acknowledge the usual suspects of my funding agency, uh, my advisors, my office, friends, family, and cheese, and the things that got me through this semester, including um, Ludwig Bronson and FSU football. And here's my summary. I'll take any questions. Uh, we can open the floor for questions, so questions in the room, and also if you have questions um, online, please feel free to raise your hand and we can take those online as well. Uh, I, this is very well done, uh, taking a ton of UAS flights and trying to composite them and back out sometimes that was the trend. I, uh, Identify with a lot of that, so very good job. Um, I'm sure I've asked you this before, but uh, were there any surface vent stations with uh, like uh, or surface energy balance stations so that you could get um, uh, sets more like new fluxes near the copters? I think that'd be really interesting to tie some of these changes to. Um, to Unfortunately, the only uh, surface energy balance station was at the main AMF site. Um, we're not flying at because it was at an airport. Um, <laughs> um, I this is one of those things that I remember watching them install it, but I've never seen the data ever again. And I can't remember if they just installed a sonic anemometer, if it was a ecore system. Um, but that was at the coastal center. I don't know what happened to that data. I saw them install the tower. I've never seen the data since. Yes. Plus, I was told by the people from New York. Mm -hmm. okay. I just had a request to review a paper, so I might know soon more about those things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um. So did, did you um look at radar data to try and pinpoint where the where the front where the CPU front might be? I so I did um, most of kind of my subjective sea breeze front identification using um, the Coptersan data and then used radar satellite data as a sanity check. Um, so as much as I used the change point algorithm, it was also subjectively fact checked to make sure we're not just trusting this kind of black box of change point algorithm. But it seems it worked well. Yeah. So the timing is pretty good then. Yep. Um, some of them were altered by uh, 30 minutes, um, thinking that, you know, this, it identifies the shift here, but I think we can go one flight earlier. Um, but yeah, overall, it was pretty good. Yeah. 
Uh, great talk. Um, so I was curious when you did the rate of change, um, what, what, what the reasoning was for choosing the 200 meter layer as opposed to? So that is a good question. It was kind of to not overwhelm myself with layers, but see if there are um, any differences in you know, just the surface layer versus the highest one. And three layers to analyze seemed like a good option. Um, I played around with looking at 100 meter layers and um, 300. The patterns were overall the same. So it was pretty much just a, a balance. So when you look at the histograms with the rate of change, um, and maybe we can go back to that slide. Uh, those, you, you said it's the two hours after the passage of the sea for you. Mm -hmm. Is that the maximum value that you then chose in the two hour period or all of the values in the two hour period? All of the values. So some of the rebounding of the boundary layer, mm -hmm. like uh, if it's initially cooled and but then warmed back up again, that would be included in those histograms as well. Yes. Um, most of any of that boundary layer rebound typically happened after two and a half hours, which is kind of why I chose that two hour mark. But we do see a lot of near zero values because often there was a, a change and then very consistent um temperatures or uh, mixing ratios for that remainder of the two hours um, you calculated the rate of change as basically the temperature difference from one profile to the next yep so, at each of those layers yep. uh, so in this first half of this talk you did a lot of looking at the different types of sea freezes i found that very interesting uh, and then in the second half, we, we were looking at the relationships to you know, how convection mm -hmm. um, is related to the environments. Uh, so I know that you are limited on the cases that you have to look at, but do you have you know any thoughts based on what you've seen so far about how the different types of sea breezes may connect to mm -hmm. the environmental relationships to convection? Yeah. Um, so if we where is that? Where is that little graphic? There we go. So limited by cases for sure. Um, none of these pure events were convective. Um, so that kind of takes out one of our major um, differences because now we're just looking at these corkscrew versus synoptic cases, which were the primary drivers. And I would expect the, um, honestly, synoptic to have a little bit more convective potential um, just because it's kind of adding on to an environment that's already been um, convectively primed. And we see that um, we do have a lot of these kind of outliers. I would definitely have to look more into it. Um, I really wanted to be able to create an analysis looking at cases of convection that were very shallow versus deeper. They're all shallow except for one. Um, and that one is also influenced by synoptic forcing. So not really a reliable distribution, <laughs> but I think it would be it would be kind of difficult um, to tease out the differences between these with the data set we have. Um, bringing in uh, Clamp's data set to get a broader um, distribution would probably be beneficial. Yeah. Like for example, the ones that you have warming and drying are kind of with synoptic, makes me think that you're basically shifting the sea breeze circulation over your site with time. Like you're getting the substance that they pushed in. I'm wondering if you're seeing, if you have any source to look at, like, oh, these synoptic types often have a stronger uh, sinking motion behind them mm -hmm. than these other types. 
Um, I could definitely look into that. I think the Seabree, it was kind of just looking through the vertical velocity from the coastal center. I expected to see some sort of signature along the front lines and it, it was kind of buried um, amongst the convective turbulence. So I would definitely have to take a closer look because that could make sense um because i was expecting to see you know at least some amount of rising motion sometimes it wasn't but it wasn't always coherent structures who are still the small very um thermal type bubbles um but yeah that would be an interesting reasoning yeah i'd imagine you'd have to do a lot of that to keep it out mm -hmm. uh, but could be down to see yeah that's not the if there are no other questions, I think we can thank Francesca for an interesting talk.